you know, making trucks is great, but until you have infrastructure, they're not going to, they're not going to sell or be bought or be usable. The sage words of Mr. Ron Hunt you heard there at the top. Hunt's a veteran of the trucking world who got involved with electric truck startup Exos Trucks some time back. He's now with another new venture on the charging infrastructure side. And the experience of the recent year's hype and real world results in some cases around electric class 8 truck implementation has him, yeah, sounding a bit like many an over the road owner operator when it comes to the absolutely huge barriers that exist to any widespread adoption of electric class 8s. I'm Todd Dills, your host for this Overdrive Radio edition, dropping to the podcast feed October 27th, 2023, and subsequently at the world-famous OverdriveOnline.com. But this week, my colleague Alex Lockie unveiled and quite nicely contextualized Overdrive's readers' views on the current state of electrification as it relates to the specific needs of most OTR businesses. Putting it quite succinctly, Here's what one commenter on a recent survey of readers we conducted said about the current nature of all battery electric technology as it relates to bedrock operational feasibility. Quote, It's not going to work, the power grid can't handle it, and the trucks don't go far enough on a charge. Now if that glided right past your listening brain, again, with feeling, it's not going to work, the power grid can't handle it, and the trucks don't go far enough on a charge. Fair enough, and certainly true on all counts if you think about the load of an untold hundreds of thousands of diesel rigs newly suddenly demanding power from the grid all at once. But as Ron Hunt and his colleagues at the Ford Mobility Company, and I'm sure many of you know, there's growing use of electric units, but the quote-unquote electric revolution will be a good long time in coming. When I talked with three of the company's reps in late summer, early fall, Rob Kelly there had this to say, for instance, about the total population of electric class eights operating in California. 125 or so class eight electric tractors working right now out, out in the wild. It is certainly growing fast though, Ron Hunt emphasized, and it's in Port Drayage where it's most prominent for good reason. The California Air Resources Board has done everything they can to really make the market there. The Indy Beer deadline for Port Drayage haulers to register their diesels within CARB system and as of the first of the year, if lawsuits don't derail this particular deadline, and a little more on those lawsuits later, as of the first of this year, any truck registered to work California ports must be a quote unquote zero emissions vehicle. We'll use that ZEV shorthand a bit here, though no manufactured product in today's world is truly zero emissions, as we all know. Foreign Mobility is aiming nonetheless to be a power provider with subscription-based charging access to sites in both Southern and Northern California, specifically built with drainage trucks in mind. I wrote about their first proof of concept and a deal they built with Small Fleet Height Logistics recently. Height owner Rudy Diaz leased five electric units working directly with Forum on those purchases and with the electric power included in the lease payment. It's been challenging in some ways dealing with recalls on first and at best, second generation equipment with the trucks, likewise squaring the investment put into it all by the small fleet owner with the return. Yet Diaz does feel like it's working for him, generally, particularly as time goes on and diesel costs are avoided. It's working for Forum too. And they're hoping to bring that truck lease and power subscription model directly to truckers as they build a plan six facilities, with more on the way. Today on the podcast, excerpts from my talk with Rob Kelly, Ron Hunt, and one more forum rep about how the business got its start and just where it's planning to go to serve drage haulers in California, and perhaps beyond. Stop fuel from gelling this winter with Howe's Diesel Treat, North America's number one trusted anti-gel. Right now, you need Howe's Diesel Treat more than ever, not only to keep you gel free, but to fight the shortcomings of today's ULSD by adding vital lubricity, removing water, and preventing deposits. The only guaranteed anti-gel on the market, Diesel Treat also boosts fuel economy and improves performance. This winter, do yourself a favor and add Howe's Diesel Treat at every fill-up. Visit Howe'sProducts.com for more information. That's right. You can find plenty more about Howe's anti-gel diesel treat formula at H-O-W-E-S. That's howesproducts.com. Here's Forum Mobility Senior Vice President Rob Kelly setting us up with the strong solar power industry roots of the new power services provider for dray haulers. 
so my introduction is uh, I worked at a company called Solar City. So I was already in renewable energy infrastructure with that company. We got bought by Tesla. And um, after two years at Tesla and 10 years at Solar City, I decided that I wanted to take my understanding of energy and move it over into transportation. And I found this startup called Ampli Power um, and Ampli got uh, was doing something very similar to what we're doing, building infrastructure for the conversion of uh, ICE vehicles to EVs. We were kind of looking at all markets. So we had customers that were in school districts, transit agencies, yeah. ride hailing. We we're kind of doing it all um, and did that for uh, two and a half years when Matt and Topher Rob Kelly's referencing their forum mobility co-founders Topher Woods and Matt Leduc. Vladder now, the company CEO. And Topher came calling on me through mutual friends, just kind of wanting to understand the marketplace and the opportunity and electrification. They too had come from a long history of infrastructure development, um, okay. mostly in renewables and solar, big utility scale solar. And, you know, saw the same thing I had seen a few years prior was, People are going to need help in this area. There's going to be a big infrastructure investment, and that's what we're good at. We just need to change from, you know, renewable energy infrastructure to EVSE charging infrastructure. So uh, right, right. Lo load instead of uh, generation. And so I kind of talked them through what I thought the opportunity was, and um, they started building a business plan to move into this space and uh, asked me to join them and I did. Um, and we decided together that a uh, little more concentration on this drayage market with California coming out with the mandates that they are, special focus on you know drayage, um, right. cleaning up the air around the ports, that that was probably gonna be a particularly interesting opportunity in electrification. And in a marketplace right. where, you know, you could kind of build a relationship um, and a network of these depots that would all kind of help this overall fleet operate. Uh, right. and, and, and here we are, but we didn't understand the fleet market really well. So we started joining trade associations and other things to, to become more familiar with our customer. Um, and luckily, uh, I met Ron along the way, and Ron has had a long history in kind of trucking and goods movement. Okay. And he's really helped expand our uh, understanding of the marketplace as well as meet meet real contacts through his Rolodex. Um, yeah. It's been just over a year since I uh, joined the team. And uh, I come from a background here in Southern California, like Rob said, of over a few decades of various transportation freight logistics related roles so kind of touched most everything domestically you know over the road intermodal uh brokerage warehouse and distribution yard management ltl truckload you know pretty much dry cold whatever whatever my first foray into uh this new this new i was on the services side all those years and decades yeah. And then a couple of years ago, I was able to start up with Exos Trucks, a battery electric OEM here in LA. And that was kind of my entry and introduction to the space we're in now. And obviously, I saw the writing on the wall that, um, you know, making trucks is great. But until you have infrastructure, they're not going to they're not going to sell or be bought or be usable. So uh, fortunate enough to make the move over just over a year ago, like I said, and, uh, you know, just feel like I'm going out and educating, de-stressing, guiding, and consulting. You know, I'm not really out there to sell anything. It just kind of sells itself. They're under mandates. You're probably pretty well versed I'm on advanced yep. clean fleets. Um, these drage operators are all under mandates. They, they're like, oh, you know, trucks are, how much do they cost? How long does it take to charge? You know, what's a kilowatt hour? How much do they weigh? Of course, I like to redirect them to the bigger, let them know that I'll answer all those questions and I'm going to be happy to guide and educate them a little bit, but they've got a much bigger problem to, to battle. And that is the charging side of things. So once I go through some checklists of things that they normally cannot check off as far as land ownership or long leases or space or money or energy, panel power, resources, 
uh, permitting, environmental construction, two years plus, you know, they're just, by the end, I just say, hey, we're building these charging depots. You can subscribe and just come and park and charge here for a flat rate. And they're like, oh my gosh, done. Where do I right. sign? You know, it's like, it sells itself at that point. Yeah. I don't, I don't think you, you guys have gotten these things fully uh, un developed and built yet, right? We've got one site developed. It's behind our customer's gate, Rudy's, Rudy's uh, establishment. Oh, yeah. So yeah. those chargers have been running since December. He's operating the trucks, the BYD and the Volvo truck today. He has more coming. Um, but really through that experience, we decided, you know, a third party network of chargers makes more sense than trying to find places where we can build infrastructure at people's sites themselves. Um, so we have, right, two, three, four. We have six sites under development right now, um, yeah. all in permitting phases, um, site control, but going through permitting. So that's four in Southern California and two in Northern California, um, surrounding. So one inside the Port of Oakland, one inside the Port of Long Beach, and then kind of some facilities uh, extending that network out. Cool. And there's. Uh... Those six are ones where we already do have site control. So there's a dozen or more additional that are at earlier stages of development. So the idea, we've got a very focused target market of the drainage industry. Of course, we're talking to other trucking companies and food distribution companies that are still showing an interest as well. But, um, you know, we're looking at port to inland corridor, 50 miles or so um, in, you know, in the port areas. So we do offer the lease back of the truck as well. Um, we don't push that as a requirement. Uh, there are some others in our space that kind of, you have to take a whole package. Um, okay. We're agnostic to the trucks. We'll guide and consult them through that process. If they want to end up leasing it through us as a package deal, we'll do that. If they end up wanting to buy or lease it through the dealer, we can just uh, get them on a charging subscription. So of course it's all subscription only, no retail. Um, Right. You know, they're able to, to lock in their, their spots and uh, make sure they've got the charging that they need. Ron Hunt, former Mobility's regional director around the California port trucking world, noted the option that Rudy Diaz and Height Logistics took to begin their journey to electric vehicles. As previously noted, leasing battery electric trucks through Forum Mobility directly. As I wrote when we profiled Height's move in that arena so far at overdriveonline.com, he has declined to disclose his own lease cost per truck, but noted that electric power included, an, an individual owner might get into a truck with the company at a rate between $5,500 and $6,500 monthly. That's a mammoth lease payment, but also keep in mind you're paying for power there, too, not spending a dime on diesel. Leasing a truck through form this way for Diaz took away the necessity of negotiating California's incentive programs to make the extremely expensive BYD Volvo electric trucks he's employing at least somewhat more affordable. Forum's Rob Kelly noted Diaz's estimate is in the ballpark, though it's difficult to put a hard number on lease costs given the range of grant programs for electric trucks that might apply to a small fleet in California. Different incentive levels. There's yeah, one called right. HFIP, there's one called Innovative Small E Fleet. Um, yeah. You get plus ups if you're in certain communities. So his yeah. his general sense of, of that number makes uh, it is right because yeah, it depends. Okay. The answer is yeah. it depends. It depends okay. on the it's truck on. too. Yeah, truck depends costs vary a little bit by about a hundred yeah. grand or so. Um, so it can get up to you know it can get up higher than that. Um, but that's that would be the low to mid range probably. So yeah, there are a lot of variables yeah. to that. But yeah. yeah, the idea is that you the way we're setting them up is where the the drivers can report to work here. They we've got parking for their personal vehicles. They unplug the truck and they head out and they come yep. back. Most of it's going to be dwell uh, charging where they're just tractor only and they're going to charge for three to five hours minimum. And we'll have some higher powered uh, chargers with some pull through areas where they can come in with a container or trailer on their back and do a quick uh, top off to finish, you know, get home or finish their routing. Maybe they'll be there for 20 minutes up to an hour, hour and a half and they can move on out of there. Um, so there's a couple other quick tidbits about our operation we're offering. Things like a night dwell, a day dwell, a dedicated dispenser, a dedicated whole charger. So we're, we tried to semi-customize uh, the plans, you know, with some productization right. so that we can be flexible. And we, we work with the customer to understand how that's going to work in the new world because um, it's a new world for them and they have to start to understand uh, 
how they're going to become. I tell them, hey, you guys are going to become the experts and figure out how you want to run your business. I'm just going to try to guide you a little bit and bring bring some of these new insights and, and considerations to the table and allow them to start to, you know, over the coming months right. and years, become experts at how to run it. But uh, we just try to help them with utilization uh, to make sure their cost per truck is as low as possible um, with their subscription de decisions, as well as uh, a little bit of future proofing is in there. A lot of the customers um, we talk about, you know, not just getting in bare minimum for the first year, you know, it's a multi-year commitment. And obviously this is a permanent um, uh, commitment, you know, as far as going zero emissions in the industry. So start getting them thinking of year two, year three, and they start to kind of future proof a little bit, start yeah. padding up. So there's some more tidbits for you to absorb. I, of course, do not come across many uh, owners of uh, electric trucks today that actually have been running them. Um, are, are you finding uh, particular uh, headaches to work through with Rudy from a maintenance perspective? I know he, uh, I think he has had to kind of trade in some, bring some back and, and trade out some trucks because there were some problems and such. Um, you know, any lessons being learned, I guess, from on the equipment side uh, from from his having his operation up and running, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot to learn. Obviously, this is uh, some first generation equipment. So we've we've had our issues. I, I think all the more reason to put a third party who's concentration is keeping this equipment working in place it makes a lot of sense they, they've got enough to do to run their carrier business we're, we're finding that uh interoperability is uh is the new word that we're chasing a lot right you introduce a new truck it gets a new update in its software it doesn't really communicate to the charger the exact same way um the communication between those is called ocpp and so we're Technically, we're kind of always messing around with that stuff. And then and then just trying to expose all the data that will allow Rudy to make good decisions moving forward in terms of, you know, what is the real um, efficiency of the vehicle? What is its true distance, depending on how big the load is? There's a lot of learning that's going on at this early stage. And I think that the people who dive into this first are going to have a significant advantage over everybody else and their understanding sure. of the equipment um but also you know lucky enough to get press like rudy some inbound calls from big shippers that want exposure to zero emissions moves as they try to tackle their own esg goals so i think the early mover has a huge advantage learning access to the biggest subsidies just like solar those those will go down over time as um as the prices start to compete with ice engines and uh and then being recognized out there as a carrier that can offer zero emissions moves is a huge advantage esg rob kelly said there that stands for environmental social and governance initiatives increasingly part of big corporate efforts all around that extends to big shippers and warehousers too but he's getting out there small fleet height logistics owner rudy diaz have certainly benefited from the implementation of battery electric trucks in their southern california port drayage operation his press about the move has made the rounds, even hitting Wired Magazine, not to mention more local outlets. In short, long term, there well could be a revenue and general business building benefit of going electric. Yet when I talked with Diaz in reporting his fleet story, he, like most in trucking, tended to calculate return on investment in more hard cost terms. Even so, with the savings on diesel, he feels like he'll be in the black on his lease costs in relatively short order. That said, Battery electric trucking and OTR operations is simply not ready for prime time. As noted previously in, in the story published October 25th at OverdriveOnline.com, in part detailing results of our survey of the readership about interest in electric powertrains and results at mostly, yes, drayage fleets out west. The ACT Research Organization did a total cost of ownership analysis of battery electric vehicles earlier this year and found only one application where the juice was really worth the squeeze today. One application other than local refuse, that is. What was the application? You guessed it. Short haul or dredge. Yet even with California's mandates for dray fleets coming into play at year's end, it's still early days for electric trucks. Foreign Mobility's Rob Kelly and Ron Hunt well know that, though the numbers are getting bigger by the day. 
is Ron Lutz and what follows. Twenty-five or so class eight electric tractors working right now out, out in the wild. In California, yeah. In California, yeah, just in California yeah. but yeah, that that number was like twenty-five last summer, you know, and like forty last fall. So it's exponentially growing. Um, yep. For sure. What kind of a timeline do you guys? have on your um some of your sites getting uh or your your full network of six they're getting uh fully done yeah good question it's a full race every single one of ours has a different authority having jurisdiction over sure. the permitting process so we'll see who's the easiest <laughs> to work with um our first sites will start opening probably late summer next year and okay. we, we hope to have all six of those first ones open by uh kind of q4 of next year um but we'll always be developing we'll always have a handful of sites under development once once we get a pretty good retention on some customers for our first six we'll start developing the next sites right on the heels of that so we'll, okay. we'll always be turning on new sites um okay. if everything goes to plan have you have you have you been working with owners other than and rudy um uh on I'm just kind of laying the groundwork for actually them coming on board uh, through you guys. Yeah. Yeah. We've got yeah. a bunch of different discussions with carriers looking to order their first uh, electric trucks. We've got, we've got some already on order that will be using our right. sites. Um, and then we're talking to, you know, a couple dozen other ones, you know, informing them about where our sites are, when those will be, open how do we coordinate the right timing for them to have a truck at that time and uh and going through kind of their pricing options on our different products of do they want a dedicated couple chargers do they just want to use a charger overnight and pick up the truck in the morning so um yeah a, a few dozen is probably where we're at and then we'll have adam what do you think we'll have 400 dispensers available by the end of next year is that a good round number I counted 600. Awesome. Um, Got and, some work to uh, do. Right. Uh, that was like, it, you know, I, I knocked on those two other sites. So I was considering our first tranche to be the the four Northern California, four Southern uh, okay. with 600 dispensers on in the next, you know, 12 to 24 months. That's Adam Browning, Executive Policy Vice President with Forum Mobility, the new voice there. Browning detailed some of the funding sitting in wait to pour concrete at sites once all of the permitting was fully in place, including a $400 million worth of a joint venture with CBRE Investment Management. As with the prospects of buying one of the new electric vehicles, not uncommon to hear real prices absent any grant funding upward of $400,000 in many cases, the cost of building infrastructure of this kind is absolutely massive. The company certainly got its work cut out for it. Here's more from Adam Browning. There's a couple other companies in our space and, you know, they've all got their strengths and our our strength. A lot of us come over from the solar industry where our superpower is identifying spots on the grid where you can interconnect and bring massive amounts of power and then actually building. Um, got really strong track record of uh, getting stuff built bringing on and developing a lot more of the, the trucking experience. But the, the backstory is, is like, we know how to build stuff and electrical equipment on the grid. So that's yep. one of the, uh, the differentiating assets that we, that we bring. Another difference. We're focused hundred percent on drayage and right, right. Um, we're, our goal is to build an ecosystem that works for your dray operator so that they've yep. got a place to charge beginning, middle and end, um, yep. and, uh, can make it work for that sector vertically um yeah other companies have other approaches to you know diversify the different types of uh right. vehicles that bring in and uh, maybe it'll work for them maybe it won't but our focus again is to right. we're there to be there for uh to make the the full cycle the full ecosystem work for drainage I think part of what we're trying to do here is to like incubate the business models and the technologies that yeah. are then grow uh west yep. to east um figuratively and literally uh and yep. 
I don't, you know, like I've talked to the drivers of those Tesla semis and they say they're a legit 400, 500 mile truck. Um, That's somewhat, somewhat long, right? So you get, you get started on that. Yeah. There has been some real world range performance data to emerge about the Tesla model. But as Alex Lockheed's reported in recent times, Mr. Musk's claim of a 500 mile range at 81,000 pounds certainly hasn't yet been entirely vindicated. Figures on the unloaded weight of the Tesla Semi seem to have been closely guarded throughout its entire existence. 500 miles though, even if achievable, just doesn't cut it truly over the road without huge operational adjustments for many truckers. So, you know, we've seen this movie before, like when I got started in solar, yeah. solar was 10 bucks a watt and uh, just a rounding error in the overall scheme of things. And through focused sort of policy driven market development, like that technology just crushed it. And now, you know, uh, latest I saw right. we're selling a gigawatts worth of solar a day globally. It's the cheapest source of new power out there. Um, right. So change is possible. Technology driven change really is. Um, and we view this as just the just the beginning, the catalyst. Right. Um, it's gonna gonna grow quite a bit. I'd also right. I'd also add on the marketplace. Uh, all those big over the road carriers have most of them have drayage operations as well. Yeah, oh, a lot yeah. of them have terminals in the greater LA market, and uh, yep. so there's a lot there's a lot of those conversations going on with that marketplace with us. Um, yep. You know, because they they do have terminals, you know, near the ports or in the South Bay or in the Inland Empire, or, you know, somewhere up north in the Valley there. So there's yep. uh, a lot of overlap there. And then you know, speaking of the competition and some of the others out there doing things we're doing, again, I just want to reiterate something that I've, you know, I, I learned at Exos and. Uh, and I see, I see in the marketplace is I just really love our hyper focus on what we're doing to execute well because the money can run out really fast if you try to do too much. Um, uh, Exos, Nicola, and some of the others in our space, I, I worry are going to follow that same pattern where they're trying to touch different markets and industries and, and segments and different classes of vehicles and you know and and even you know maybe some different. Uh, energy technologies you know and they're trying to kind of get their foot into every aspect of it uh i really like how we're running lean and mean we know what our market is and we know it's yep. got plenty of room to grow you know so it's it's a big deal yeah there's thirty three thousand trucks operating in drage just in california alone and all those trucks uh by 2036 will have to be zero emissions so maybe that is the California Trucking Association's recent lawsuit filed in federal district court against the advanced clean fleets rule in the state could well change the parameters of what CARB's doing there, but I might guess it's fairly safe to assume that might not impact the end of year deadline for drays trucks to be registered with CARB and, after the deadline, be ZEVs in some form if newly registered. But we'll see on that front as news comes. Here's Ron Hunt finally on what he's advised fleets he's worked with out west, thinking about the reality of that deadline, which sparked something of a diesel pre-buy of sorts among many out there. I was going to say, when I talk to my customers about that, um, we can't offer them a zero emissions truck and a charging solution January 1, 2024. Um, as Rob stated, it's going to be you know second half later in the year before we even get started on that stuff. So, and the trucks right, right now, a lot of them are taking twelve months, up to twelve months for pre-order. Yep. Um, but I say, hey, you know, I, I don't speak for Carb, I don't, can't guarantee anything. But you have two choices: you can go to Carb earlier in the year if you need an exception or you're, you're in a pinch, uh, and have no PO with anybody and no progress and nothing, and you're probably got a lot better chance of getting a little. If they're going to offer any exceptions or help, they'll they'll do it to those probably that are have started something in twenty three at least and have some kind of POs. Um, they might let them bring in you know some used diesels for a year until there's there's evs deliver something like that is feasible. Right. Um, it's all they can do at this point. I can't. We can't build or deliver. You know the OEMs can't all deliver any sooner. And uh, and and to Rob's point earlier, they're going to you know or I don't know if Adam said it. They're going to sell out too, and our prices will go up. And they yeah. keep saying the trucks are going to get cheaper. Well, you know, Volvo's a year or two ago were in the threes. Now they're in the fours. Everything's going up, 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 and our pricing will almost assuredly go up. Um, so, you know, the ones that are 
jumping on board or starting to realize it's time to get get their feet wet. And to Rob's other point, it allows them to start to scale. I said, it's not like an ERP. Don't worry about it. You're not flipping a switch and changing your whole company in one day. You're going to be able to start small. The total cost of ownership probably won't be too bad. You'll probably get, you'll probably be okay. We work through some numbers and forecasting. But even if you take a little hit on a couple small percentage of your trucks, you know, um, it's what you got to do, but you'll be positioning yourself um, to be ahead of the pack mm -hmm. and to scale faster and to be more experienced, more efficient in how you operate them um, moving forward. You have that edge. Sure. Anyway, most owner operators I know are in wait and see mode around this stuff, but that edge Hunt talks about is, at least on the minds of some small fleet owners like Diaz and Dreage out west. Keep tuned for more reporting on electric drivetrains in the porthole world out west, as noted at the top. And for now, just thanks to Rob Kelly, Ron Hunt, and Adam Browning for the time spent with me to talk through the designs of Ford Mobility. A lot of work yet to be done to get things off the ground, but an interesting look at yet another place where California's equipment regulation meets the real world of business and infrastructure investment. Finally, start our ongoing series around where electric drive and other alternative fuel tech stand for owner-operator reality today in the show notes wherever you're listening. Overdrive Radio is on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple, and Google Podcasts. Tune in most any platform. Subscribe so you don't miss an episode, and if you're enjoying these, leave us a rating or review there. Big thanks for it. Overdrive Radio is a production of Overdrive, the voice of the American truck. It's edited and produced by me, Todd Dills, with the acoustic guitar and other support of truck songwriter Long Haul Paul Marhofer. The theme is Legend of the Snake Man by Marhofer, featuring the guitar work of Travis, the Snake Man himself, Whammock, Terry Two Socks Richardson on bass, keys by Tisha Mingo, Jim Whitehead, and the drums, Mr. Andrew Marshall. The podcast is backed up further by Overdrive's own news editor, Matt Cole. Executive editor Alex Lockie and video editors Lawson Rudisel and Andrew Gwynn. See you next time.